Hi, welcome to Learning the Basics of Apache NiFi for IoT. I'm Timothy Spann. I'm the Principal Dataflow Field Engineer at Cloudera. And uh, let's get into it. As I mentioned, I'm a DZone leader, big data MVP, and I run a virtual meetup. So uh, join me at our next event. Uh, what we're gonna cover today is the basics of Apache NiFi. So first up, you know, what is NiFi? We'll give you some of the general capabilities. I'm gonna do a tour in the environment live, show you what we can do, what everything does, so you learn your way around the environment. Then I'll show you a bunch of examples doing uh, Internet of Things flows, how we do data processing, a couple of options, how we could get data in from different uh, edge devices, and then what we could finally do with that data, all from one easy to use open source tool. So Apache NiFi is great because it doesn't just work with one type of data. So if I have structured data, that's fine. Semi-structured like JSON or CSV works. Unstructured data, which could be as unstructured as binary data, a zip file, an image, a video, any sort of binary data that maybe you don't need to process, but you need to move from one place to another, we could do that. And you could do it with almost any type of data you might have in all different varieties of industries or home data. I've done this with military construction data. Today we'll cover a couple of different common data sources that uh, are you get when you're getting from IoT, things like MQTT, REST and web and internet sockets, Apache Kafka, which is uh, one of the messaging buses, show you how we interact with files and different types of logs, outputs from Python, which could be running on devices. And you know, when we're tra transferring files from different uh, servers or devices, we often will use something like FTP. And I'll show you some of the best practices when you're trying to build these flows. So you could solve any of the issues you might be having right now with edge data ingest. As a reference, this is a, a typical layout for a simple NiFi driven application, whether it's IoT or not. So we've got data sources coming in. NiFi does the ingest, does some transformation validation. And uh, in most cases, we'll push it to some storage layer such as uh, Impala or I'll publish this for some data syndication with Kafka so that it can be used by other servers, other systems, other consumers of data. And very often that data will also feed into machine learning, data science applications, where we might wanna do some model execution to get some classification results, whether that's deep learning or just regular machine learning. And we've got a couple other open source tools that help us do that. So today we're pulling in some data, sitting on some routers and devices. We've got logs coming in. NiFi is handling all of this and connecting us right into Kudu. I'm also gonna show you a little bit of what Flink brings to the uh, table. Apache Flink is another open source tool designed for doing ultra fast event processing. And what's nice for our use case today, I'm gonna take device data get it through NiFi to clean it up, get it into Kafka so I could share it. And then Flink is gonna read it, but it's gonna do it in an interesting way. We don't have to write any complex applications. Don't have to deploy things in a difficult manner. I'm just gonna write a simple select star to be able to grab that data event at a time as it comes into the system. And you can imagine what you could do with the power of SQL. And then What's data if no one can look at it? So I'm bringing it into Kudu table. Uh, Kudu is a data storage engine that we have Apache Impala on top of. That shows up just like any other database table. So we'll use the open source visualization component Apache Hue. This will let me run SQL, see the results. I could also do some simple charts, but at a minimum, this gives you an idea. I can get this data, it's coming in. It's in a format that people expect. If I need to build reports, extract data, plug this into your reporting tool, I could do that all from uh, 
whatever open environment you have. Now, I mentioned what NIFI can do, but where did it come from? You know, what, what, what's some of the background here? So this is right from Wiki. I think they summed it up pretty well. NIFI has been around for almost 14 years at this point. It was originally a U.S. government project as they needed to be able to grab data from all different uh, systems, wherever they may be. You know, basically extracting it from systems, doing some kind of transformation, loading it somewhere else. It was originally called Niagara Files because the idea of a waterfall of data. They shortened it to NIFI, which is little catchier and uses less space. And then in 2014, this technology, which had been mature at that point, became open source and donated to the Apache Foundation. And that's been uh, out there for people to use for a number of years. You'll get these slides and you'll see uh, a number of resources that I've included, including my blog and my everything Apache NiFi GitHub that has a lot of information that'll help you you know, on your journey to learning Apache NiFi. Now, one of the things that makes it really powerful is you'll see when we go into the environment, it's an open source web-based tool. It's all drag or drop. I don't have to write scripts. I don't have to compile. I don't have to deploy code. I'm dragging and dropping, connecting boxes, doing flow-based programming, but behind the scenes, this is not just for simple use cases. I can scale to millions of events a second, can ingest terabytes or petabytes of data, and I can make it uh, dynamically controlled based on what I'm doing. So if I want to do you know, more data than maybe I can handle, I could set up back pressure so that it'll queue up while I'm waiting to process. I have ability to adjust what kind of guarantees I have on the delivery of data. I could decide what the throughput levels are, how much latency I support. All those sort of things are adjustable right through the UI. Some of them can be pre-configured through uh, configuration files or through administrative tools like Apache Ambari or uh, Cloudera Manager. Everything allows for full security. Uh, we have SSL everywhere. HTTPS can be supported for ingest, for communications, for exports. Same with uh, secure FTP, pretty much all the secure TCP IP channels. And what's beyond that and something that was part of the original focus of the product is that we have full governance and data provenance. What this means is Every piece of data that comes into the system, I have a full record of it, a full audit log. You don't have to hand wire something up to do that. You don't have to be uh, thinking of a strategy to figure out what's happening with my data. I know at every step of the way, what data I have, what size it is, when it arrived, how it changed, who changed it, what, you know, what was the value before, what was it after. This is great if you've got secure data or things that you really need to keep track of. And then beyond that, you may say, well, I like NiFi, but it's missing one critical connector, one critical piece of data it doesn't work with. It doesn't have a connection pool for some certain item. You know, there's some little thing missing. Fortunately, you can extend this. Everything again is open source. The API to add your own processors and controllers is very straightforward. We give you a Maven archetype for developers out there. You type uh, one command line prompt. It builds you a runnable example. You just have to put in your code to do something and whatever parameters you want to do. And then you drop it, comes into the screen like one of the boxes you see here. So if you wanted to write your own type of routing, you could add that. That might let you uh, integrate with one of your own internal systems that may be proprietary or may not have an open source component for yet. Or if you wanna connect to uh, an existing security or monitoring system, those connectors are built there and they're very extensible. If I need to create a new kind of task, very easy to do. Now, one thing that's unique about NiFi, 
but will be very familiar for people who've used the internet and use the web. How it works is when we bring in data, we have the content. And that is, could be part of a file, it could be JSON, whatever it is, that's, we call that uh, in the flow file, the content. Now there's another piece which resembles the headers in HTTP. These we call attributes. These are key value pairs that we put metadata in or any data that makes sense from the previous action. So if I'm loading a file, I wanna know the name of the file, the size, the path I got it from, when it was last changed, any of that sort of metadata that you have access to, we like to put it there. If you write your own, you can add whatever values you want to these attributes. It's also a way that you can not change your data, keep it item potent and add enrichment around it without changing that data. So having that header and the content live together, but uh, be slightly separate there is important. Again, they're all tracked with the provenance. Now, uh, overall, NIFI does some pretty, it's a pretty simple three-step process that most people have. When you're trying to look at a problem, you say, I need to acquire some kind of data usually. And NIFI has almost a hundred or more out of the box, different connectors to get and acquire that data. Now, there's also a ton in the open source. I've written some, because sometimes you come across something that maybe is only interesting to you or it's a smaller community, or it doesn't belong in the uh, standard part of NIFI. So you write a processor to do that. But out of the box, you've got JDBC, you've got all the Hadoop components, all the cloud sources, all the TCP IP sources, you know, all the major file formats, whether it's XML, HL7, JSON, ton of different things are supported. And when I bring it in, I could do those things I mentioned before, whether that's routing to determine what happens next, or maybe I throw the data away, transformation, and that could be it's a zip file, unzip it. It's a tar file, split it up into multiple files. If it has secure encryption, decrypt it. If it doesn't have encryption, encrypt it. You know, grab IP data and geo enrich it to get the lat long. Translate it from JSON to Avro. You know, lots of different things you could do. Make two copies of it. Make, you know, turn two records into one record. Lots of those sort of things. And it, there's no limit to how many you could do. I could take one source of data, send it to 50 different destinations. And that's the final part. You did some processing. Now that data is changed or I've changed those attribute metadata around it. Let me deliver that somewhere, many somewheres. So maybe we'll see in the examples, I'm sending it to Kafka. I send it to uh, HDFS. I send it to an Impala table. I send it to a Slack channel. Could have sent it to a database, file directory, email pretty much anywhere you need to send your data in an enterprise system or in some kind of research facility, you are able to do that. And now under the covers, we've got 300 plus of these processors plus hundreds more in the open source you could just pull in yourself. Uh, one thing I wanted to add there is this is not a fragile system designed to be clustered, scale up to you know hundreds of nodes, support billions of events a second, with guaranteed delivery there. It's a nice system. And even though it does look like just a GUI, there is version control under that. So I need to make a flow to do something. I save my versions and then I could have a DevOps tool, push that to another server or make that available in the open source for people to use. And I'll give you some of those flows in a link later so you could download some of mine that we're showing today and you could use them in your own environment. Now we touched on the provenance. This is the lineage that tells me what everything happened. And what's nice is it's all indexed. It all has a unique ID for every file that or event that came in the system. It's got a timestamp, it's got everything that changed. This comes in really important if someone tells you yeah, I gave you a file with 10,000 records. And then when you deliver it to where your final end, end point is, you only had 500 or none. What happened to that data? Did it really come in? What did it look like? 
you have all the data to know. And it's not just in some table or directory somewhere. This is live data that you could use as part of your coding. So you could check, you know, number of records at some point and say, okay, I only got a hundred records. They told me a thousand when it started, it was, you know, 200, you know, what happened? Let me send an alert. Let me change the data, make me retry the data, all those sort of things there. Or if someone's trying to do, you know, some uh, fixing later and they come into the system, you know, where is this particular record? I can look up the key, match that to a unique ID. Then say if it came to Kafka, I can match it to an offset and a topic and a partition. And all of this provenance data, I could push to things like Apache Atlas or to your own tracking system, which is stored in a table and people could search, okay, wh where did this key come in? How did it change? You know, how big was it when it came in? All that sort of data is available to you. This metadata can be very valuable if you have audits or if there's any government regulations around your data, or you just don't want to lose data, so you want to know what happened to it. Another thing that's come in handy to me is sometimes you have different types of data. I have data that comes in every hour. That's a standard load. I expect it every hour. It's the standard data. We process it when we process it. But on that same channel, I could also have an alert that says server seven is running out of disk space. It has minutes before it's going to crash. I don't want to wait for that big load of data that I process every hour before I could send that message. And I don't want to have to write a separate NiFi cluster to just do alerts. Every step in here, and you'll see these cues when we go into the examples, these all have the ability to have priority. So I could prioritize those alerts to say, if an alert comes by, you know, this attribute will be set, push them in front of these other messages. They happen every hour, they can wait. Now, another thing that's uh, come into uh, play in the last couple versions of NiFi is a lot of people have structured data. It's very common. And structured data can also mean semi-structured data that follows a standard schema, things like CSV and JSON. They might always look the same. You know, I always have the same field names, always have the same types to them. This is a schema data I expect from a microservice or it comes out of a database. It always looks the same and I'm gonna put it in a table with the same format or a known format. So I could use these schemas or NiFi can guess what that schema is for you. And it could do things like run a SQL statement against that data while it's in process. This is nice. I don't have to learn regular expressions. I don't have to try to figure out some custom logic of how to translate data between types. You know, how do I route this one? Okay, I have something that routes CSV. Now they tell me the data is JSON or XML. Now I've got to figure a way to do that. And then at the end, I always want the data to come out as Avro. Uh, you know, where do I do that step to convert it? How do I make that conversion easy? By having a standard schema, I can easily read it and write it to no matter what type it is and do those translations as part of a routing. So I can have SQL on the events as they come in, route it based on that SQL, transform it based on that SQL, all in a single step operating on thousands of records at a time. So it's very fast but it does all the functionality you need. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of that. This is a, a great paradigm if you know what your data looks like. Doesn't matter if it's coming from sensors, works great with IoT. I'll show you a couple different sources of that. Another feature NiFi has is some people will tell me they don't want to have a cluster somewhere. You know, I run NiFi when I need it. You know, maybe it's, I want to consume a record from a file, push it to Kafka or read from Kafka, manipulate, transform the data, push it to another topic. It happens as a job, or I only want it to happen when an event occurs, or I want to schedule it. I don't want to set up a cluster for that. Maybe I'm running on Kubernetes, maybe in uh, Docker containers, or maybe I just don't want to run a server. Uh, the stateless engine lets you do that now. 
It gives you the functionality of NiFi, but I don't have to run that UI. I don't run a server unless I'm running your flow. So I'm just running flow at a time and I just run it once, complete it, or I can have it continuously running uh, until someone wants to kill it. That is very helpful for a lot of use cases, especially ones where you want something to happen in like a one transaction or one event. That's what the stateless engine is there. So if you've seen NiFi in the past and you didn't need a web UI, didn't want to use any disk for your actions, but you like the idea of NiFi simple flows, stateless is the great engine for you. It comes with the standard build of NiFi. You just run this command line you see at the top, run the shell stateless mode. You set up a configuration file that looks like this tells me what NiFi registry, we mentioned that for version control, which one of those I'm using, is there a login, what bucket you're using, which is something like dev or production, what individual unique ID for that flow, it'll grab that flow, apply your parameters, apply your SSL and any Kerberos credentials you might have, and then just run it for you makes it really easy. This is something you could trigger with DevOps tools, trigger in a cloud environment, spin it up, run it, shut it down. Something that's uh, very important if you have those kind of events at a time, you don't want to leave a, cl a cluster running. Now those parameters also come in handy if you are running a cluster. We can connect those same parameters, set a group, share them, you know, have them secure, it makes it very easy if I want to run that same flow, but I have different values there. It's a different server name, different login, different Kafka topic, different table name, you know, you know parameters. This makes it very reusable, something you could save once, pull out of the registry, put in another cluster or run it in stateless mode. That's a nice one. I'll just show you today, retry flow file. This is a programmatic way for you to decide what happens if that system I'm interacting with doesn't respond correctly. Maybe it's offline, maybe it failed. You know, there's lots of things. Maybe my network is slow and let you configure that programmatically to decide, I'm gonna try three times. I'm gonna put a wait in there, maybe 10 seconds between tries. If I can't get it working in three times, let me do something else. So in this case, you see beneath here, I've got data coming in. I try to push that to Kafka. If the if Kafka server is not up or I can't get to it for some reason, I'll try a couple times. And then when that doesn't work, I'm just gonna push it to uh, something very stable like uh, HDFS or a uh, object store. Now, one thing you'll notice when I go into the demo is that each little connection between these steps in a flow there's a little name thing, it says queued on it, and it may have a number on there. This is where we do back pressure. These are little cues that make sure I don't lose data, that while my process is running, uh, if anything, if the, it's running too slow, the data will queue up here. And this is a configurable back pressure for you to decide how many things do I wanna queue up before I tell the process before me to stop running. And this will do this for you automatically. You could set a fixed size or you could use our machine learning with a couple different uh, mathematical equations or create your own that decide, okay, I'm okay with this growing 14% based on average usage and I'll let it dynamically adjust the size of these queues so we don't run out of space and trigger back pressure. You know, those are all options you can set. There's a lot of options in each individual step. What's nice is this is each step. So if I have a thousand of them, but I only care about one because that's the downstream one that goes to Oracle, that one I can configure and I don't have to worry about the other ones, but I can set defaults if need be. Now, another thing that's important, if you've done Spark, if you've done Impala, Parquet files are extremely common. So we've added readers and writers for them. So I could do something like take a JSON file off a directory, you know, do a SQL query on it and write it instantly as Parquet. 
So you've got one step to take raw data, convert it into data that's friendly for Spark and Impala, fast, indexed, and you don't have to do much else. And also, because it's using these record paradigms, I can grab thousands of records at a time and send them out. So I don't have to worry about any kind of small files issue. I've got a, links to a couple of articles that help you explore that. Some other features of NIFI that are nice. We've got a bunch of different reporting tasks. So if you have existing reporting tools, we can publish into that. Uh, we have a couple different ways to do uh, enrichment on these records. But I think the most critical, if you're doing any kind of uh, ELT or ETL, is these lookup services. We had a couple before. Some were based on C CVS. Some were based on XML files or Mongo or Redis. But we've added some real enterprise ones here. We've got one for database. This connects to any JDBC store, commonly uh, relational database. The Kudu one, this is a great one. Kudu is really fast, so is HBase. So this will let me look at a field in a record and replace it with something. We also have one to do this with REST. So if you've got REST-based microservices you want to use to take a value and transform it or augment it or just do a lookup. You know, I, I get the, the name Tim in and I want to look up my client ID and put that in the record. I could do that in two steps, very fast at scale, thousands of records at a time. Makes great for loading data. Now we mentioned running all this stateless NIFI. That's a great way to do it. But we also sometimes need an actual cluster and that needs to be stateful. And we need to be able to have three, five, seven, a regular cluster amount in case the server goes down or gets slow or crashes. So we use Zookeeper to keep that in sync. Uh, every one of the nodes has a Zookeeper client. And then the Zookeeper will elect a cluster coordinator who decides how jobs are managed and who's in charge. And then you've got a primary node. We use this because in some use cases, you will need to run a job on only one server. And that could be because a file exists and if five servers try to access it at the same time, it's not gonna make sense. Or there's a lock on it, or it's a server like Oracle and maybe I can't hit it with 25 concurrent connections and have a good experience. Or I only want one copy of the data and it really can't be broken up at that time. Let one NIFI node read it and then I'll distribute it after that. NIFI has built in uh, load balancing and distribution. We mentioned version control. It's about as easy to connect as you can imagine. We talked about data enrichment and transformation. Those lookup records make it really easy. It can be as simple as looking up via a file, or we showed some of them before with Kudu or databases. Ingesting databases and putting them into uh, multiple data stores is as simple as a handful of steps. I've included some articles there. Finally, I'll show you some example IoT flows. This one you're seeing right here is about as simple as it comes, but in two steps, I read data from Kafka, put it in a permanent store. When you look at this, there's no mention of field names. There's no mention of anything other than a table name and a topic. And then we use a schema to know what that data is, transform it into the type it needs to be and store it where it needs to go. Makes for a rapid development experience that you could push right to production. Now, as part of this, NIFI does have some uh, hurdles to get past. It's so easy to do. People will often not reuse things. They won't think of using parameters. They won't realize that what you do in NIFI can be very reusable. So they'll make a lot of one-off things. They'll put a lot of hard coding in there. And then when someone else wants to use it, they'll have to write it from scratch. You know, you're not getting your best experience with NIFI then. Use parameters, you know, make things reusable, put them into chunks as different process groups so other people can use them in your system. If you need a custom processor to do something that's maybe specific to uh, your company, or if you already have Java business logic, 
Let's wrap that in a custom processor so we could deploy it. Uh, use the ones that uh, are supported out there in the industry. Cloudera has written and tested a lot of these in the enterprise. Those are known to be fast performance and do what you expect. And if you could use record processors, do that every day. If you know what this data is, it is faster, easier, much better experience. Now let, let's look at a demo here. It's nice to talk about it, but let's see what NiFi really can do and what is the power. Now this is perhaps the simplest example I could show you. This, I'm grabbing some transaction logs and all I need to specify is a directory. And I'm telling it, let's start at the beginning of the file. I'm gonna split those up. One line becomes a flow file. And as you see here, we already have 300,000. You know, it builds up pretty quickly. This is that queue I was talking about. What's unique about NiFi is I could start and stop things without breaking anything. So I can configure this right here. I can name it. If this is something you might wanna check later, you might wanna name in it. Remember that priority? I could change that right here. You know, if I have an attribute, I could add it as the prioritizer. I could change how many objects, how big they are, how I want to handle load balancing between nodes. You know, I could round robin it, partition it based on one of these attributes send it always to one. I can also compress that data if it made sense for me. What's also nice is that data sitting in the queue, it's not lost, it's waiting. As you see here, we could see a number of the attributes involved in this particular event. You know, name of the file, that unique ID we have for each one, how long it's been sitting in the queue, you know, how big it is, what type it is, those sort of things. And I have access to the actual data which is a line from a log. And then when I'm done, I could just push it to Kafka. I have a broker. I set my login information, what topic it's going to by using transactions. Do I have a schema? What's the name of this producer? That sort of thing. Let's send 300,000 messages there. Pretty straightforward. This is one flow just to do that. As you see here, I stop this. This is still running and it's running after. We don't lose data because someone stopped something or something went wrong. Like here, it's mad I stopped it. Sure. What we can see here too is we get a summary of every piece of information of things going on. You see, I stopped this processor. That's how many uh, records just came in. This is what I'm reading. The task, I could see a graph of everything going on with the data. Those sort of things, pretty pretty cool. What's nice is underneath the covers, everything is a REST API. So if I wanna know this data, I could just put it into developer console, see all those REST calls and do it myself. So I don't wanna use the GUI. You can do the same with the command line tool that it comes with. Very easy process. I've got another NiFi flow here to do a little different things. I've got a couple different options here what we could do with NiFi really depends on what makes sense for your case of data and which uh, what you're doing. So for this one, I'm getting data from uh, NVIDIA Xavier Box, which is a pretty powerful edge device that has GPUs, that has a lot of RAM. It does a lot for an end device. And I could see what uh, what's happening with this box. So I'm sending data from that device over HTTP and I have all the information I need to know about it. Again, that unique ID. I've got a schema for this data. I've got the data here. It's a number of records and I could decide here, how do I wanna route this? Looking at the data, I can look at any of those attributes. I can look into the data. Here, I'm just gonna distribute it based on a couple of attributes. If you'll notice here, these are images. Like we mentioned, we could deal with structured, unstructured, semi-structured data in the same flow. Here you'll look, this looks like a little different from most of the data you're used to, because this is an image 
and we'll just bring in an image. I could do whatever processing I want to do on images. I could send that to a deep learning library. I have some built into NiFi for doing things like single shot detection, all those things. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of options you could do with images. Uh, we mentioned those queries. I can do queries on data. Here, I don't have a schema yet. So I'm just gonna infer what it is. And then when I'm done, I still want it as JSON. So I'll just keep it as JSON. That's fine for doing what we're doing here. Not a big deal. As you see here, I've got a lot of different flows within here. And I'm processing over a gigabyte of data as the data comes in. Uh, another common flow, I've got things coming off of a Google Coral box. Again, doing some routing, checking if it's valid data. And here, again, I've got some images coming in and some sensor readings. So here I'm gonna do another query on those values. One of the values is a temperature. So I'm gonna check to see if that temperature is over 80 degrees. So hopefully it's not. Uh, if it's really hot, I'm going to uh, do something with that data. That's our warm data here. And we could just take a look at some of the data in here and we can look at the actual data. And if we look in here for temperature, for Fahrenheit, I could see it's 96 degrees. That's pretty warm. That's probably the reason why it exceeded that. We might want to send an alert. We might want to do other processing. Here, I'm just going to send that to a Slack channel. And in Slack, I formatted the message. This tells me, tells me it sent a message. It just went to Slack. And if I want to configure this to do whatever I want in the message, I'm putting in the attributes I want to display and some boilerplate text just to say, you know, this is what happened in the system. And we could take a look, what channel was it sending to Coral? I could go take a look at Coral and I can see that our data got sent here. There's the unique ID. There's the label from the deep learning system. Here's the start time, here's the scoring 39%. Just to give you an idea what's going on in the system. Let's make sure we load a couple other copies here. So here I'm querying on yet another data source. This is thermal data. Again, I have the queue here queuing up as more data keeps coming in from the edge. And it's a lot of data, but uh, it doesn't matter to NiFi. I'm gonna turn on routing. And now I'm sending a whole lot of data through the system. And that happened almost instantaneously. As you see, it's coming through the system and I've got some queries here. This just gives me all the data, but in that one step, taking CSVs and converting them into JSON. Don't have to do anything specific there. And now I've got JSON versions of the data. Here I'm taking a look and taking JSON, writing it up as cleaner JSON, and then I'm pushing it to a Kafka topic. And I can look into Kafka and see everything that's going on in Kafka. Let's pick uh, an example here. I can look at any of these topics, which ones are getting data in the last six hours, who's getting a lot of messages. These were the messages from that, uh, that uh, log messages we were looking at. And there's a lot of them and we could take a look at all of them. Uh, obviously that's waiting for someone who's interested in that data to consume it. I've got other logs, I've got gas sensors, tons of different data. We were just looking at that webcam one. So I could take a look at that data. And this is showing me the results of some pictures that I'm taking on a live web camera. And then we ran TensorFlow against it and we could see what the results they think they are. Very easy for me to send that data. But how do I write those flows on the edge? NiFi's piece of it. The other piece is a smaller version of NiFi that we call uh, Minify. And to deploy a flow in Minify, I set up something similar to NiFi. Here I'm running a shell script. I can run a Python script, can run native code, whatever it is. And then I'm also grabbing images. You saw those images coming into the system. 
So when I execute this process, it sends data to me and that I'm uh, sending to NiFi over HTTP, but it's also grabbing those images. So that's a simple way for me to develop these applications. And then when I change them, I can publish it to any agent that's associated with this agent class, which is Raspbian and Java. And it'll just send this flow to them and that's the code they'll run. And they'll run it every, we could take a look. Every 60 seconds, it's gonna run that capture of sensor data. Again, a very easy way for you to send those agents out there and get results from them, see what they're doing, any events they're doing, uh, when they got deployed, very easy. I deployed one of them a couple of days ago, one of them today, very easy. So those flows are running. So we saw the logs, we saw things go to a Slack channel, over here, we're doing uh, SQL queries against those events. And again, if I wanna run additional SQL queries, I could just stop and add more. Tim query, I could do select a certain field. Maybe I only want one field. Like we saw temp F is a field. Maybe I just want that field. Maybe I wanted to do the cast on that to convert the type. I can do that. Maybe I want to do a sum. Maybe I want to do an aggregate. Whatever I want to do with this data, very easy. Here, I've had this one sitting for a little while from one of my other devices at 21,000 events. This has got a couple different types of data. I've got one where I'm reading energy readings, one where I'm reading uh, sensors, another I'm getting images, another I'm running uh, classification with the open Vino framework on that device. As you see here, I'm pushing through a number of records real time. Over here, I've got another query. Again, you know, the query this time is a parameter. So I could show you those parameters. And we have a bunch of uh, SQL queries. I could change them. Here, I'm looking at temperature. Pretty uh, frequent thing for sensors. Got a couple different uh, SQLs there, so if I want to share that SQL, very easy. And then I'm reading it and just sending it to Kafka. Pretty common use case, but I'm sending it to a couple of different flows. If we look at all the different topics here, we could see now we should be getting a bunch of data into this SCADA one, and then we'll start getting data into the energy one. I've got a lot of topics here. I've got a lot of different IoT data. This one I just started sending data into. Data might look weird, You're like why is it like that? It's Avro, so I need to use a schema to convert it into something that's viewable by me. And now it's very legible. I could see that I've got uh, humidity, pressure, temperature. You know, I've got the IP address of that device, a unique ID for it, a time. So I've got good time series IoT data here that I could do with what I want. Now, one thing that I can do with this type of data is I can do Flink, Flink SQL. Flink has let me connect to this catalog. Let me show you all the catalogs that have tables. I'm using the registry catalog. Remember I showed you those schemas in the registry? That is this guy here. I've got one for breakout, I've got weather, this SCADA data we just saw. And from there, I could show you there's a bunch of tables. Those match up to those schemas. So now I can certainly figure out what's in there. Like we were looking at uh, the SCADA one. What does that one have? Bunch of fields. Do you want to take a look at them? Let's take a look. Let's do IP address, uh, temperature, gas co, low noise from SCADA, just a regular SQL. What's different about this SQL is it's not a regular SQL. This is a live distributed application that's just been built to do that query. And it's grabbing this and this is running on a cluster. It's been deployed on top of an Apache Yarn cluster, does everything you need to do. I've just writ written a real-time streaming application that just uses SQL. It's that simple. And if you look at the top of this display, it's pulled in 133 pages of data from 
Kafka topic, and I can look at the uh, details on that. Pretty simple. If I wanted to look at another table, I could do that. We have data coming in from uh, breakout. You can take a look at that one. As you see here, this job just got canceled. I've written a bunch of jobs. What's interesting here is this SQL supports things like insert. So if I wanted to take the results from breakout and join them together with the results from SCADA, if I had some ID that would join them, I could do that join and do an insert into a third table. That table would be defined by a topic here. Uh, it could be whatever has the same number of fields. I have one in here for uh, what I call global sensor events, which is all the data together. And you could just define it how you want. Uh, these schemas are very easy to work with. And that would just show up here and start populating into that other Kafka topic. So we've got things in Kafka. We're able to look at data as it's ingested with Flink. Uh, the last thing that we wanted to uh, show you is we also want to store this data. You know, you have data coming in, a lot of different sources, routing in a lot of different ways, but how do I store it? Here, I got a lot of messages coming in from MQTT as I'm reading from an MQTT uh, broker on a very specific topic. As it's coming in, I'm going to write that to a kudu table with an upsert. So if I get repeated data, I don't care. Remember that retry. If it's not available, let's retry again. I'm also going to take that data as JSON and validate it. Make sure it, it matches that schema and then push it to a Kafka topic. So we can look, is that breakout data in Kafka? We could find that data and go right there. Common way to do that is just we'll go here and search. Here's this Kafka topic. We've got an alert on there because no one's been reading the data. It's Avro has a schema. Boom, the data's coming in. Is it getting into a table? I can see it right here. Just came in. I'm grabbing some of the fields. I've got over 100 records. I could see what I want with them. I could choose what fields they are. This is Apache Hue. You know, if I want to see different uh, columns, I just add them to my query. Screen's a little uh, small here, so I can't show you everything, but it, it shows you how easy it is to load data. And now that's in, in Impala, I can connect this with Tableau or anything that uses JDBC to access a uh, table. Very easy to write reports now that you've got it there. The same thing I have with uh, that SCADA data we were looking at. Same thing, I have that stored in a table. Very easy for you to do queries, sort them, do whatever you'd want to do. Within uh, Kafka, we have the uh, ability to change that and join them together if we wanted. Very simple to do. And then we'll get uh, our running nodes here. You can see all the jobs that completed. Very easy to do from the NiFi side. Any of these simple flows do more than uh, just pull from IoT. It makes it very easy for you to acquire that data, validate it, transform it, enrich it, and then push it into enterprise systems, whether they're in the cloud, on premise, whatever your data store is, you know, it could be Mongo, it could be a relational data store, it could be, you know, an object store, any of these things. So if I wanted to send that data to another place, very easy to do. This makes for a very powerful tool for doing everything you need to do with IoT data. Hopefully this was, uh, showed you the basics of using Apache NiFi. I've included a number of articles there that dive deeper into specific pieces and parts which might be important. Things like, how do I write a query? You know, what's supported in the SQL? Behind the scenes, this is Apache Calcite, which is a common SQL engine that's used in NiFi, Phoenix, and a number of other things. Very easy for me to do IoT at scale. You know, I'm running 
in my house here only a few devices. I think I have six behind me. So it's only six of them. Maybe they're publishing a few records a second each. You know, maybe that's only a few thousand images. This is very easy for you to start off at that level with, you know, a few million records and then move your way up to billions, trillions, as much data as you have. We can get that in one environment. And it doesn't matter if the data is binary, if it is JSON, CSV, XML, it's coming off a raw device and you need to convert it. I could do all that here with that full provenance to know everything that's going on, full tracking so I know how many records have come in, how big are they, what type are they, are there errors, what do I want to do if there's an error, how do I handle that, interacting with storage systems, interacting with distributed event processing, interacting with, you know, schemas that let me know what my data is supposed to look like, so I could validate it to say this one better is has to be an int, it has to have this field, or a field is optional because it's it could be null. You know, all of that from one environment, been able to see that data as it's coming in based on how many messages are coming through the system, what do they look like? Very easy to monitor this. I could see who's consuming my data. I have an application over here that's consuming the energy data. This is a Kafka Connect app that's just sitting on this topic, consuming that data, writing it to HCFS. It's very easy to share this data between systems. I hope you've learned uh, a little bit about NiFi. Uh, to learn more, we've got an open community where we chat about NiFi and a number of other open source projects. Also, I run an event uh, virtually online, The Future of Data. You could join uh, that one or any of the other ones we have around the world. Uh, this has been great. Hopefully uh, you've learned something here and uh, thanks for coming to my talk about learning the basics of Apache NiFi for IoT.